What's the difference between atrial fibrillation and typical atrial flutter? So people get this mixed up all the time. Even a lot of doctors get this mixed up, even general cardiologists. There is a distinct difference between atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter. So remember, atrial fibrillation is the most common abnormal heart rhythm out of the 15 different abnormal heart rhythms. If you believe that abnormal heart rhythms are defined as an abnormal source of electricity that forms in a different wall of your heart, and remember there's four chambers in your heart with six walls each, so it's a lot of different rhythms. It's like 15 different abnormal rhythms that you can have problems with. If you believe that an abnormal rhythm is defined as an abnormal source of electricity developing in a different wall of your heart that now can randomly wake up override and take over control of your heart away from the normal source, which is located in the roof of your heart, called your sinus node or normal rhythm, and then tell your heart to speed up, causing palpitations, and then the rhythm goes back to sleep and your normal rhythm takes back over control. And now you're back in normal rhythm up until the abnormal rhythm wakes up again. If you believe that that's the definition of an abnormal rhythm and that there are 15 different abnormal rhythms that we know about and see on a regular basis, then Atrial fibrillation is the most common abnormal rhythm out of the 15. It is one that's just caused by getting older. It is primarily an age-related rhythm problem. So anyone can get it if they live long enough. Now, the second most common abnormal heart rhythm is called typical atrial flutter. Typical atrial flutter. So this is an abnormal rhythm that's also age-related, and so it's also very common but it is distinctly different from atrial fibrillation. Now, I can see why there's a lot of confusion because there's a lot of similarity between the two rhythms. So for example, both rhythms are not directly dangerous, life-threatening heart rhythms, meaning both rhythms, when they wake up and take over control of your heart, they speed your heart rate up, but they never speed your heart rate up or cannot speed your heart rate up to life-threatening speeds where your heart could go at two, three, 400 beats per minute or faster and make you pass out and die by cutting off blood by your brain. The speeds at which atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter go at tend to be much less than that. The atrial flutter can sometimes get your heart rate up to around 200 or a little bit more than 200 beats per minute, but it's not gonna go much faster than that. And while that is very fast, it is not life-threatening fast. To be life-threatening fast, your heart rate would have to be over 250, 300 to 400 beats per minute. At that speed, your heart rate is beating so incredibly fast that it doesn't actually have time to pump blood. It doesn't have time to fill up, pump, fill up, pump. It's just kind of quivering, fasciculating, vibrating. And so it's not pushing and you're not circulating blood and you're not getting oxygen in your brain, and so you just pass it and die. It's what you see on TV where people just collapse and you have to shock them with the defibrillator paddles to save their life. That's not a heart attack, that's called a cardiac arrest, and that's caused by a dangerous rhythm. Now, atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter are both not directly dangerous rhythms. Similarly, both are treated just for symptoms. So they make your heart go fast, they make you feel like you're exercising, they cause severe palpitations, shortness of breath, maybe a little bit of chest discomfort, maybe a little bit of lightheadedness, but they're not gonna kill you. And so we treat both mainly for symptoms. And the way you treat both for symptoms is very similar. We can slow it down with rate controlling medications so you feel it less and you can tolerate it more. We can suppress it with an anti-arrhythmic medication to keep the cells artificially asleep. We can try to do an ablation where we map the cells from the inside and try to get rid of them so you go in and out of it less because you got rid of it from the inside. Very similar. And then both unfortunately can cause little blood clots to form in your heart that could break loose, flood out of your heart, flood up your brain, cut off blood supply to your brain, cause a stroke. And that's why we would put both of them on blood thinners to reduce that risk to less than 1%. So I can see why people say, well, they're pretty much similar. And from a non-cardiac electrophysiologist perspective or non-electrical cardiologist perspective, I can see why people just say, hey, you know, they're pretty much the same. Whether the EKG is reading atrial flutter or it's reading atrial fibrillation, you know, just call everything AFib because from their standpoint, it's treated the same. So it's kind of like it's the same rhythm, but it's not the same rhythm. It's very, very, they are distinctly different rhythms. And yes, that makes more of a difference to those of us who specialize in this area, but there, it is important. And it has more of an importance when you're talking about the fact that if you're trying to ablate the rhythms, they're completely different rhythms from completely different areas of the heart AFib originates in the walls of the left upper chamber of the heart, the left atrium, and then 
atrial flutter, or typical atrial flutter, the most common atrial flutter, originates from the floor of the right upper chamber of the heart. And so therefore, there are different areas, and what we do to cauterize them or get rid of them is very different. And then also, atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter have different mechanisms. So atrial fibrillation is a progressive rhythm problem. The older you get, the more of these sources, abnormal sources of AFib cells or sources form, and then they kind of start on the back wall or posterior wall of that left upper chamber of the heart. There's little corners where these veins called the pulmonary veins insert into that chamber. It's kind of in those corners that it starts, and then it just spreads. It spreads to the back wall, the posterior, what we call the posterior wall, the roof, then the lateral wall near where that appendage, pouch-like structure, we call the left atrial appendage, inserts, and then the floor, and then the front wall, and then the septum, and then eventually spreads to the right atrium. So it's a progressive problem. So like a force fire that's getting bigger and bigger, how you can ablate the atrial fibrillation gets more and more technically challenging and difficult, the bigger it is. The bigger the force fire is, the harder it is to get rid of it, and it can become permanent. When the entire force fire is covered, when all six walls of that chamber are covered with AFib cells, that's when the AFib is permanent and we cannot get that person out of AFib. They're just gonna be in it for the rest of their life. But atrial flutter has a different mechanism. It's actually a circuit in the right upper chamber of the heart that we can terminate or break by cauterizing just the floor of that chamber. And so it's actually a rhythm that doesn't progress as you get older. It's whether you're in it a lot or a little, it doesn't really matter. The circuit is the same. It's not gonna grow more. AFib, the more of these AFib cells you have on the more walls, the more it tends to wake up. So there's a general correlation between how big your forest fire is and how much it's waking up. But atrial flutter, there's not really a correlation that way. It can wake up a little bit, it can wake up a lot. It's still the same circuit. And that circuit is actually very easy these days to get rid of. Getting rid of that circuit or cauterizing on that floor to, to break that circuit is very easy. It can take you know, as little as half an hour, at most an hour or so, most of the time, and the success rate is 95 to 97% or more, and that's a cure rate. That's not a temporary get rid of like the AFib until it grows back in other areas and comes back, it's 100% cure. So therefore, because atrial flutter, or rather typical atrial flutter, is a curable rhythm, if you only have that rhythm and you really don't have any other rhythm like AFib, you could get off of all medicines, including the blood thinner. Whereas if you have AFib, it's not as simple as that. Not only do you know it's gonna come back even if you got rid of all of it with an ablation, regardless whether you needed an advanced ablation or a simple ablation to get rid of a bigger or smaller force fire, you know that it's non-permanent cure. So if the person's risk is significant for clots and strokes, you don't stop their blood thinner because you know that if the AFib ever reappears or comes back, they're gonna be at risk and you need to keep them on the blood thinner. So major differences between the two rhythms. Now there's a third category called an atypical atrial flutter. And that's not the same as the typical atrial flutter circuit. An atypical atrial flutter is more related to AFib. It's usually when we are getting rid of the AFib. Uh, sometimes when you get rid of enough AFib and there's a little bit of it, le of it left, it can create little circuits around areas of scar in that chamber. And it's technically, an, a, we call it an atrial flutter type rhythm but it's very different from the one that occurs in the right upper chamber of the heart. That one's just very common to see, that one's very curable, whereas an atypical atrial flutter is usually seen in connection with atrial fibrillation. Either they're AFib, they're going into AFib, and then sometimes they morph into this atypical atrial flutter, which is still circuits around the sources of AFib, or if somebody tried to ablate the AFib and was successful in getting rid of it, but there was a little bit of patchy scar left over from what they did, they can create some of these atypical atrial flutter circuits that may need to be touched up with an ablation or suppressed with an androgenic drug. So that's kind of more related to atrial fibrillation, but typical, most common typical atrial flutter is in the right upper chamber of the heart, the right atrium. It's very curable, does not progress, and if you get rid of it, the person does not have to be on any medicines or a blood thinner. Now, sometimes we see people develop this typical atrial flutter first, and then we get rid of it. And then years later, they get old enough, they develop AFib. Sometimes people develop AFib first. And then over time, we start to see this typical atrial flutter occur. And now they, we tell them if we get rid of the typical atrial flutter, they're still going to leave them with the AFib. And we know that that's not permanently curable because the AFib is not permanently curable. So it just kind of depends on the situation that the person is in to decide what we need to do. But unfortunately, because atrial flutter specifically typical atrial flutter and atrial fibrillation are so similar. And for those who are not electrical cardiologists, 
treated pretty much the same and are not life-threatening rhythms, unfortunately, we see a lot of people, a lot of doctors, and even patients just call everything AFib. And that's unfortunate because you also have to realize that if somebody's labeled incorrectly, then if they come to a cardiac electrophysiologist, it's harder for us to decide what's going on and what you really need. That's one thing. Also, when you look at the EKG, which is the measurement of the electricity flowing through your heart at that moment, and that's how we know what rhythm you're in because those squiggly little lines correspond to the electrical impulses flowing through your heart, causing your heart to beat. And so we can tell which wall of the heart, those of us who are trained can tell which wall of your heart these impulses are originating from. That's why we know if you're under the control of your normal rhythm or under the control of an abnormal rhythm, specifically atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter, or typical atrial flutter or atypical atrial flutter or atrial tachycardia or supraventricular tachycardia or ventricular tachycardia. There's like 15 different rhythms. So we can tell which rhythm you're suffering from based on the EKG. Well, a lot of people don't read the EKG very well. And so they rely on the computer's interpretation. And so there's a little computer interpretation at the top of the EKG, and that's the computer saying what it thinks the person's rhythm is. Unfortunately, that computer is not that smart. It's actually rather dumb. And it's wrong in terms of identifying the rhythm correctly, easily 40 to 50% of the time. So sometimes people will show up in the emergency room and the top line of the EKG will say the person's in AFib, atrial fibrillation, and they say, oh, this person's in atrial fibrillation. And then later on, I overread it and I say, well, no, it's really not atrial fibrillation. It's it's their normal rhythm, just a little bit irregular. Sinus rhythm, a little bit irregular. Or in atrial flutter, typical or atypical, which is a distinctly different rhythm. But unfortunately, once that gets labeled, sometimes it just kind of gets onto the chart and then the person's labeled as having AFib for the rest of their life. Or I get a consult and it's for AFib and then I find out, well, they're actually not having AFib, they're having atrial flutter, typical or atypical, or a supraventricular tachycardia or some different rhythm that's similar, but not exactly that rhythm. And so therefore, if you do go to somebody, especially if you switch doctors to somebody new, make sure that your diagnosis is correct and that it wasn't like somebody put down, oh, uh, they have AFib because they call everything AFib and now you're stuck with that and then people try to treat you and it's not even the correct rhythm. People get money out of you, but it shouldn't be about making money. It should be about doing the right thing for patients. And so just make sure that there is confusion between these two. They are not the same rhythm. They are distinctly different rhythms. They are treated similarly with medications and other ways, but in terms of the ablation and the mechanism and whether one's permanent versus curable, there is differences between the two rhythms.